Yeah, I'll, I'll start off there. Okay, welcome back. So, this symbol which I uh, had in the top of my lectures, uh, some of you know it. It's actually, I believe, from ancient Egypt. Maybe every culture has some concept like this. And the idea is simply that in the early universe, we are seeing the fundamental laws that we actually study in the laboratory and have studied down to a scale of about 10 to the minus 18 centimeters, that these are the same laws that govern the evolution of the universe on the larger scales up to the horizon, which is about here, and you know, down through the scales of galaxies, clusters, planets, stars, you know, uh, uh, sorry, stars, planets, uh, down to the human scale, which is roughly interestingly sort of in between on a log scale between the largest and the smallest scales in the universe. And so far we have probed on this side uh, down from molecules, atoms to the electric scale which is about here and in fact it even has updated dark matter decoupling which is around here. And on this side we have gone up to this point. So the holy grail is of course what is happening around the Planck scale. But um, as you see, our current cosmology is actually still very primitive. We are dealing with rather simple concepts. Um, you know, uh, equilibrium thermodynamics uh, is really the basic tool, which is uh, rather simple-minded. It works because the parameters are right, but um, we will have to think harder theoretically uh, as was also evident from Andre's lectures, how to actually make sense both theoretically from this side of what's happening at the quantum gravity scale and uh, also of, from the cosmological side of perturbations on horizon scales where there are very interesting anomalies in the data. Uh, in the microwave background, for example, there's a drop of power on the scale of the horizon, um, which is kind of weird, but it is there in the data. And so maybe there is new physics to be discovered up there where the snake is swallowing it still. But let's now carry on with um, the discussion of nucleosynthesis. So this is uh, a, a very old question, and it starts with a very fundamental uh, uh, query, which is, you know, where, where did all the elements in the universe come from? So we have this amazing periodic table with these irregularities that Mendeleev and others identified. So our belief is that if you take the abundance of elements and plot them as a function of atomic number as found in nature, you find that of course the most abundant element is hydrogen followed by helium, which is about 10% by uh, uh, number, so about a quarter by mass. And then there are trace amounts of everything else. And these peaks that you see are, reflect the binding energies of the nuclei in the shell model, which you would all have studied. Uh, they are particularly stable objects. There are some elements which are very rare, like boron, beryllium, uh, you know, lithium. These are you know, created by the fragmentation of heavier particles, for example, in cosmic ray propagation. And then um, these, all these elements are supposed to be produced by rapid neutron capture during supernovae in, in uh, core collapse supernovae, except that there has been a recent update uh, from the observation of the neutron star merger. Now it is believed that actually most of this stuff, gold, platinum, all this was actually made uh, in, in neutron star mergers, not, not by uh, a supernova explosion. But our main interest is to the very left of this diagram, uh, helium, because as you already admitted, we don't know the origin of hydrogen. Hydrogen is made out of protons and electrons. There is one proton and one electron left over for every 10 to the 9 or so pairs of protons uh, and electrons in the early universe. We don't know where they came from, right? We are glad that they came from somewhere, otherwise you'd not be here. But uh, our next step, therefore, is to understand the abundance of helium. So George Gamow is basically credited with having founded this theory and in fact predicted the temperature of the microwave background which is the residual radiation from the time and here is a paper by Dr. George Gamow <laughs> from 1948 in Nature and he in fact as you see is plotting the same abundance as a function of a number in order to try to argue something about primordial nucleosynthesis. 
But I'll tell you the truth. The truth is that Gamma was a very smart guy with lots of nice ideas, but he couldn't calculate too well. So he left that to his student, Ralph Alpha, and this guy is uh, uh, Robert Herman, who was his postdoc. And these guys did the calculations, okay? And Gamma, however, had a great sense of humor. So when they published this paper, Alpha, uh, Herman, and Gamma, and this is in Physical Review D, he says, it has been shown in previous work uh, that the observed relative abundance of the elements can be explained by building up of nuclei by uh, neutron captures during the early stages of the expanding universe. And the first reference is alpha, beta, and gamma. Now, Bette actually had nothing to do with this paper at all, but Gamma only put his name in, and this paper was published on 1st April, because he included Bette, because uh, Herman stubbornly refused to change his name to Delta. <laughs> so, so, you know, and uh, anyway, fortunately, Alpha and Herman's uh, you know, contributions have been recognized actually not so long ago, about 10 years ago, the uh, American Physical Society did give them an achievement award. You know, actually their work was foundational, I would say, in, in this business. So in fact, the paper that I referred to earlier already, if you have to read one paper on the early universe, read this paper, 1953. So, you know, you're definitely going to find it in some library or the other. And essentially, this paper spells out the framework of the hot Big Bang cosmology as we use it today. It was not up to date, obviously, because at the time, for example, we didn't even know that the tau neutrino existed. So they work with two species of neutrino. But otherwise, it's all there, OK? <coughs> And the modern theory of nucleosynthesis is basically based on this, uh, is pa on this paper. Uh, this followed, actually, there was an earlier paper in 1950 by Hayashi, who pointed out that neutrons and protons would have come into chemical equilibrium in the early universe. Right? They would interchange between each other at a rate faster than the expansion rate of the universe. And this is crucial, because once you come into equilibrium, you have no history. In equilibrium, there is no arrow of time. So this means that you can actually presume to compute things which are unaffected, completely independent of what happened at the Planck scale. You see, this is rather important. Because if you don't have this decoupling, as you would call it in particle physics, you know, the physics of the Planck scale would affect what we measure at LEP or LHC. It doesn't, because those are, we think, higher dimensional operators with their irrelevant at low energies. Similarly, once you come into equilibrium in the early universe, what happened at previous epochs doesn't matter. And so we, of course, if it was always in equilibrium, it would be a very boring universe. It would not evolve at all. So essentially, it's to borrow a phrase from biology. It is like punctuated equilibrium. We have phases of quasi-equilibrium. Then we move to another state of quasi-equilibrium. Or at least that is the way that we treat it mathematically to make it tractable. So it is both in equilibrium and out of equilibrium. Of course, it is out of equilibrium because it evolves. But this is very important. So. Um, the dramatis, I mean, so what you are going to discuss the combination of these initial soup, uh, YLM, as, as Gamma called it. In fact, that, that's the picture on that thing. See, it says LEM, whatever that means. Does it mean something in Russian? Uh, <laughs> and, and maybe it's something fanciful that uh, he thought up. Anyway. So at early times, so these are the people that I said, so a little bit later, Jim Peebles at Princeton and Wagner, uh, Bob Wagner was at Stanford and Willie Fowler at Caltech and Fred Hoyle at Cambridge. They essentially put together the theory of primordial nucleosynthesis and Bob Wagner wrote a nice numerical code which is still in use to this day. And these are the dramatis personae, photons, electrons, positrons, three kinds of neutrinos, neutrons, protons, and this baryon to photon ratio, which is the only free parameter in the problem. And that is this quantity here, which is about 5, 10 to the minus 10, because omega b is about 5% and h square is about uh, half. So initially, we have neutrons and protons interconnected into each other through the weak interactions, the same process that we discussed a little earlier in the context of decoupling of neutrinos. And uh, 
at a certain temperature which we already calculated, this will freeze out because this rate, as I said, is going as Gf squared times t to the 5. The expansion rate is going as uh, uh, t squared over Planck mass. And therefore, they will freeze out at a temperature. Um, so uh, instead of Planck mass, I'm writing 1 over Gn here, as Gn over Gf squared to the 1 third. Earlier, I wrote it as Planck mass uh, squared, uh, Gf squared to the 1 third. And the neutron to proton ratio at this time is just the Boltzmann factor. It's the neutron proton mass difference divided by this temperature. Okay, and that's about a six. Now, this is a very interesting formula here because the temperature, freeze out temperature, you see, is determined by the competition between gravity and weak interactions. And the neutron proton mass difference is determined by both the strong interactions and the electromagnetic interactions. Okay. So all four fundamental interactions are involved there and they determine this quantity in the exponent. So this is exponentially sensitive to all the four couplings of nature. It's an extremely powerful laboratory that we have been handed. And this answer comes out to be because uh, Mn minus Mp, you know, neutrons are accidentally slightly heavier than protons by just about 1.2 MeV tiny number, very small compared to the mass of a proton, which is a GeV. This is an example of natural fine tuning, you know, something which is balanced by one part in a thousand. And that is of the same order as this. So it is basically e to the minus one or something like that. So it's one sixth. If this number had been much larger, then this would have been either one or zero. If it was one, we would have had a very different universe. If it was zero, we would have had no universe, right? So uh, this is where people are tempted to think of, you know, why is it that everything is so finely balanced? And in fact, uh, the only example of successful anthropic reasoning I know of was actually in the context of nucleosynthesis for stars. There was a prediction by Hoyle that there should be a state in carbon nucleus which corresponds to a trip absorption of three alpha particles. And when Fowler looked for it, he found it exactly where predicted. But that was not very different from today's talk of uh, the multiverse. Um, so then we have the deuterium bottleneck. So as I said, the, uh, although the binding energy of deuterium is 2.2 MeV, nucleosynthesis does not start when the temperature drops below 2.2 MeV. It drops a lot, uh, it has to drop to 0 0.07. That is because the temperature at which nucleosynthesis starts is the binding energy of deuterium divided by log of this baryon to photon ratio, which is a tiny number, because of what I said earlier. Even when the average temperature is 0 0.07 MeV, if you go 10 times, 30 times higher, right, then you get to 2.2 MeV, right? And at that point, there is still one photon per deuteron, right? If you are at a higher temperature, there would be more than one photon per deuteron. So basically, anything that you make would be immediately broken up again. <coughs> And so you have to wait uh, for this proverbial three minutes, the famous three minutes of Steve Weinberg's lovely little book, to actually uh, start doing nucleosynthesis. Meanwhile, uh, the neutrons have decayed. Their lifetime is of order 1,000 seconds, so they have gone down to a seventh. And nearly all these neutrons end up in helium. And a helium nucleus has two neutrons and two protons. So the helium mass fraction is just twice the neutron to proton ratio. And therefore, it comes out to about 25%, right? And this is a robust prediction that 25% of the universe should be helium by this simple argument. And then there are leftover traces of the elements that made helium, deuterium, helium-3. A little bit leaks through into lithium-7. And that's it. No heavier nuclei are formed because uh, the density is so light, so low. As I mentioned, it's about the density of air, right? So you have to wait for dense objects to form. They're called stars, and they have all the time in the world, 10 billion years, to then do their thing. Here we have only a few minutes to do our stuff, right? So um, you only form these elements. And the nuclear reaction network looks like that. So these are neutrons, protons, Deuterium, deuterium can go into tritium or helium-3. They can go into helium-4. Helium-4, at this point, there is an absence of stable mass numbers of 5 and 8. That is the consequence of the way things are put together in nuclei. You would have studied that in the shell model. And so because of that, there is no formation of heavier elements. A little bit leaks through into uh, lithium, 
which uh, is actually interesting. We'll discuss that later. And as I mentioned, there was a computer code written by Wagner, uh, which has been updated. And there are two other, three other competing codes today. This is the simple story. There are, in principle, if you want to use this as a precision tool, you have to worry about the fact that all this is going on in a plasma. The particles are. Um, and there are corrections because the particles uh, uh, involved uh, are charged. There are Coulomb corrections, radiative corrections, the neutrino heating that I mentioned in the last lecture due to electron positron annihilation. So there's a long paper in which all this has been discussed. Uh, much more recently, Dave Segel pointed out that there are nuclear recoil corrections which are substantial. So, you know, it's an ongoing process. People look at these things carefully. And um, some years ago, we actually showed how to consider the, all the correlated uncertainties in a consistent way. And uh, uh, that leads us to the modern picture of nucleosynthesis, which is about the same as in whenever Wagner plotted this uh, uh, famous plot of the mass fraction as a function of temperature, or if you like, time. And starting with neutrons and protons, uh, initially, everything else is zero. This scale is going from uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of few down to 10 to the minus 24. So keep an eye on the log nature. So essentially, there was nothing else. These are the abundances of deuterium and uh, helium-3 in statistical term, you know, equilibrium. So they are basically zero, calculated according to the Saha formula. But these neutrons and protons, as you see, they decouple from each other at around a second. And then around the three minutes, they start combining into deuterium. So the deuterium abundance, uh, which is marked uh, green here that shoots up, right? And then the deuterium burns into helium-4, and so does the helium-3, which is purple here. So basically, what finally wins the day is this whole 4 helium, which is this cyan line. And that then comes out asymptotically as a quarter, 10% uh, by number or a quarter by mass of the hydrogen. But there are leftover amounts of these things. And the tritium decays back into helium-3. Um, and lithium-6 and lithium-7 are also formed in tiny numbers. They're indicated here as this line here and lithium-7. Where is lithium-7? Lithium-7 is this line here, right? You also form some beryllium-7 that also is radioactive that decays into lithium-7. So all this is nuclear physics. And this is a very quick uh, snapshot of the sequence of events. So at early times, we just have a soup of fundamental particles. As I said, at this time, there is it, you still can't make deuterium because it will not survive. It will be broken up again by the photons in the wean tail. But um, you could make helium, but there are no building blocks around, right? Because deuterium is the way to, so to make, you can't have four particles coming together uh, because the probability of that is tiny, tiny in a low density medium. Otherwise, you could have made helium in a high density universe. Then at three minutes, deuterium survives. And because there are no stable nuclei, you uh, don't make anything heavier than helium. And by half an hour, nucleosynthesis is over, OK? Um, but uh, you know you, you can't do much fusion beyond that. So you make predictions about the relative abundances of uh, deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, and lithium-7 as a function of the one free parameter. And this is just a quick chart to tell you the difference between stellar nucleosynthesis, which takes billions of years, and primordial nucleosynthesis, which takes just minutes. And similarly, the evolution of the temperature here is very slow increase. Here we have rapid cooling. And here, the densities are very high, right? 100 grams per cubic centimeter in a supernova. Whereas in primordial nucleosynthesis, it's basically the density of air, OK? This may, you may not have known. It was a big surprise to me when I first learned this. And another thing is the chemical potential. Of in supernovae, it's of order one photon per baryon. It's very large. Mu is large. Here, mu is 10 to the minus 9. Right? So therefore, you have this kind of stepping on to helium, but there's a mass gap. So then you can't really form much beyond lithium. And basically, there's, you, there's almost nothing formed beyond that. Okay? And um, you have to wait to make the rest of it in stars. And that was what was pointed out in this classic paper, which I recommend you read, by Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle, which is where that plot that I showed you initially is taken from. This is the reference in reviews of modern physics. They basically accounted for everything beyond that point as due to rapid neutron capture uh, in stars uh, in supernovae, whereas we are talking just about the 
uh, um, the formation of helium. Yeah? Oh, so in order to form, uh, so it's the same argument as earlier. In fact, this was Gamow's argument. Uh, you, if you, in order to do anything, you must have your reaction rate the same as the Hubble expansion rate, right? So the Hubble expansion rate, it's radiation dominated. It just goes to as t square over the Planck scale times the number of degrees of freedom, right? Whereas the uh, uh, the reaction rate involves a density, right? So since you know the cross sections for nuclear reactions, if you want that to equate the expansion rate at the time, you can work out what the density is, and you'll find that number, right? So what Gamma actually did was to then say that the present day density of matter is whatever it is. So if I scale the density required for nuclear synthesis to the present day, right, that tells you how much the universe would have expanded in between. And then you can do the same thing for the temperature of the background radiation. And he predicted 5 degrees Kelvin. Okay. He, as I said, he couldn't calculate too well, so he rounded up. In fact, the calculation had been done much more accurately by Alpha and Herman. He rounded it up to maybe 10 degrees K. It was in that Nature paper that I showed you a picture of. And people already said there is no such radiation at that kind of temperature. It was a bit lower. right? So um, as I said yesterday, the whole history of cosmology is a history of missed opportunities to make a really impressive prediction and have it verified. Anyway, the most important reactions are listed here, which give you all these things that I talked about. And among them, uh, the crucial one is the neutron lifetime, because that normalizes the weak interaction rate. And it is very embarrassing. In the old days, I used to point to this and say, look at this nuclear reaction people. They can't even measure anything precisely. Look at the error bars. It's horrible, and so on. And then I have to confess that the neutron lifetime uh, which particle physicists measure has recently dropped by five sigma, okay? So just because of one new measurement by a Russian group, and it turned they turned out to be right. We ignored it on the particle data group for at least six years, and then finally it is uh, it been accepted that that is the correct value. But you see the other reaction rates. Um, uh, well, now we hope it'll stay there; it won't move any further. Uh, but the other reaction rates are uncertain, and there is also something called an astrophysical S factor, which is that you want these reaction rates at an energy of order a few hundred keV. But of course, you, when you measure in the lab, they're at a different temperature, so you have to scale them. That involves an additional uncertainty. But there are experiments. There is one in Gran Sasso in uh, Italy, uh, which are trying to measure this reaction. Some of these are also very important for the solar neutrino problem. So there's a lot of interest in that. Now, the uncertainties in the synthesized abundances, therefore, are correlated. Because you know this guy burns into that, but then, then that guy enters here and burns into this. And that guy then radioactively decays into this. So you see, all these uncertainties will be correlated with each other. And the abundance of any element like helium, lithium, boron is a very complex function of the uncertainties on all the input numbers. How do you deal with that? Very simple. But I'll, first, let me show you what the neutron lifetime. Why, you, why can't you calculate it theoretically? After all, it's a weak process. Well, because it is not really completely a weak process. Flavor SU3 is broken by the strong interaction. So therefore, GA over GV, the ratio of the axial to the vector couplings, is not 1. It is different from 1. And that you cannot calculate. Uh, well, maybe you can calculate it on the lattice, but you can't calculate it per per derivatively. So it's best to actually measure the neutron lifetime to directly normalize the reaction rate. And you do that at a place like Grenoble, where they have this massive reactor that is burning weapons grade uranium. In fact, they got it from this test ban treaty, all the things that had been discarded. And using that, they um, uh, trap the neutrons in a magnetic bottle. And they look to see the decay of the neutrons and fit it to an exponential. This is how you measure the neutron lifetime. And you can see the problem. If the neutrons hit the edge of the barrier, they're gone. It, they shouldn't hit the walls. And it's very difficult to trap them and know their exact number, which is why the neutron lifetime has been, as you can see here, plotted versus time. This is some fundamental quantity. This is how it has been changing. Hopefully, it has now stabilized here. And what I always find interesting is even in particle physics, where you can do the same thing with the Weinberg angle, every time the thing changes, it changes within one sigma of the previous number. But then after five years, it has moved by five sigma from the first one. 
So, you know, well, you do the best you can, I suppose. So, the propagation of errors, this is, I'll give you, show you this exercise because this is actually quite interesting. You can apply it in other uh, situations, for example, uh, the solar model, the standard solar model. So, you have a number of uh, reactions and that gives you a number of final outputs, so call them yi. This could be the helium abundance, for example, and you want to know how does uh, what is the uncertainty in the predicted helium abundance as a function of the only free parameter, the baryon to photon ratio. So I can just write that as a matrix. So I can, for every reaction, I have some uncertainty. Reaction rate k, I have some uncertainty delta r k, and so the conversion will involve a matrix element for forming the element i from the reaction k. Okay, so I can just write down a, a array of equations as I had done before. And what I just want to know now is just the covariance matrix of that. How does, the, what is the logarithmic rate of change of that abundance relative to a logarithmic rate of change of the reaction rate K, right? And then I can, from that, work out what this uncertainty is, which is fully correlated, taking into account uh, all these correlations between the individual reaction rates and so on. Right? And I can then code it as a standard sigma, uh, which uh, you can estimate by least, least squares analysis. So the advantage of doing this is that I can then read off when I plot, for example, the abundance of deuterium or lithium-7 or helium. Uh, here is helium, here is deuterium, I can read off immediately what is the most interesting reaction rate that needs to be constrained in order to reduce the uncertainty in a particular element because that is proportional to the length of that arrow which is contributing to the covariance matrix. Right? So the point is this, that of course I can do this uh, by Monte Carlo, I can just sample each of these reaction rates from the experimental distribution by some random number generator and then I can run my code and I get some output and I do this 100,000 times and then I get a band which tells me within 90% of the answer is contained within the band. But you know, running Monte Carlo is expensive. So do it once. Then calculate the covariance matrix using this prescription we have given. And in fact, what we find is the calculated uncertainty according to our prescription is bang on. This is the line is the prediction from here. Those dots are the Monte Carlo, right? So basically, you don't need to run your Monte Carlo again. Save your CPU time, okay? Go and do <laughs> whatever it is, big data. Uh, this is, can only be done analytically, right? So we now therefore have a very uh, good understanding of the uncertainties in the predicted abundance. The line widths show you the, I guess it's 90% confidence uh, in the uh, abundances. And you can see that helium, which is plotted on a linear scale conventionally, and it changes by just a couple of percent over the entire possible range of eta, uh, that's around 25%. For some reason, it is called Y conventionally. And the deuterium abundance is plotted on a log scale. That's a factor of 100,000 times smaller. And that's a very rapidly decreasing function of the baryon to photon ratio, ditto for helium-3. And lithium-7 has a double-valued nature because it's formed by different reactions here than in this high-density part. Okay, so it is double value. And the uncertainty is largest in lithium-7, it's of order 20%, whereas for helium, the uncertainty is less than 1%. So with helium, we can do precision cosmology. Here, we actually have a problem that I'll discuss. But uh, at this point, if you are, you know, a, a sort of a hardcore theorist and you don't like using computers, you'll say, well, don't tell me about covariance matrices. I want to really understand um, physically what is going on. And in fact, there is a prescription for that, which comes from a nice paper by Dimopoulos and company um, uh, some time ago. Often particle physicists who don't do cosmology at all, generally, make quite important contributions to the subject because they bring along tools which uh, are new. So these people recognize something very simple. This is a generalized transport equation or a balance equation, and this is very handy in astrophysics in a many contexts. So if I consider some object x, rate of change of x, I can write as a source minus a sink. Okay, you can't argue with that. The sink typically is proportional to the abundance itself. For example, the rate at which x particles are being destroyed would be proportional to the abundance of x. 
So therefore, the equilibrium value is just j over gamma, right? Because in equilibrium, dx by dt is zero. Okay. So this is trivial. But the general solution, okay, for this you have to do a little more work. Once you have the green function, uh, you can work out what the general value of x is in terms of a possible time variation of all these gammas and j's that I've written down here. This is simply the integral of that, okay? So therefore, if it is the case that the logarithmic rate of change of the source and the sink terms is sufficiently fast, faster than the overall expansion rate or whatever is the time scale of the problem you're looking at, then you have something you can call quasi-static equilibrium, quasi-equilibrium, okay? It will not be in equilibrium for all time, but for times which are uh, of this order, okay? Temporarily, you can consider the system to be in equilibrium, although in the long run, it will not be in equilibrium. So freeze out, which uh, Tracy slightly had discussed yesterday, occurs when gamma is of order h, and at this point, the asymptotic abundance x will simply be the equilibrium abundance at that freeze out temperature, right? And that will be just the ratio of the source term to the sink term at freeze out. Very simple. It looks simple schematically. In detail, it's more complicated because you have to identify the source and the sink terms which are most important. So for example, for nucleosynthesis, you have to go back to that table of reactions that I wrote down and you have to say, say for helium-4, what are the most important reactions? And then you have to check whether their rates do satisfy these uh, inequalities. So this is what these people did, and they could then obtain deuterium, helium-3, lithium-7 to within a factor of two. And helium-4, they got to within a few percent. So this is the same plot I showed you earlier. The full lines are the numerical solution. The dotted lines are the approximate analytic solution that you get from this. It's not bad, right? I mean, they got it. This is just doing a you know, few pages of work. No computers involved, right? And it is useful because once you have this kind of a semi-analytic understanding of what's going on, you can then use it to study the effect of new physics. You don't just have to put things into a black box and turn the handle and get some answer and you stare at it wondering whether to believe it. You can actually work it out by hand and convince yourself that that is really what's happening. So let me give you an example uh, to, for example, uh, a good example is the number of neutrino species. So uh, that is the expansion rate during nucleosynthesis depends on the number of neutrino species because that is radiation at the time. So it's effectively the number of relativistic degrees of freedom, right? And the only other parameter, as you have been saying, is the baryon to photon ratio. So it's a well-defined problem. So I can write down that the rate of change of abundance y is proportional to, of course, the baryon to photon ratio that involves in the nuclear reaction and then the cross-section for the annihilation, for the destruction of this species. And the rate of change of the temperature in regard to time, you already know uh, from the thing that we calculated earlier. So I can write down, transform little t, time, to big T, temperature, using this. And I can write down the same expression uh, as so, okay? And then this tells me, from this I can read out the degeneracy. Log of eta, right? minus log of half, because it's g star to the half. If I just take the log on both sides, log eta minus log g star is some constant. I don't care to know what this is, because this is some number, right? So I have a degeneracy line. If I change g star, then if I change eta, according to this prescription, I'll get the same answer for the abundances. I can't tell the difference between them. Right? Therefore, I can just use chi-square statistics to determine the best fit values, okay? and that is much, much faster than the tool of choice these days, which is to do some you know, Monte Carlo maximum likelihood because people have a lot of CPU time. But this is much simpler and much more transparent. And I can construct the covariance matrix in its full glory and read out all the uncertainties and therefore calculate the bound on the number of degrees of freedom, in other words, on the number of neutrino species, and um, uh, obviously I hope to get a number close to three, because there are at least three light neutrinos, 
And in fact, the tighter the constraint I get close to three, the more I can um, limit new physics, which might contribute new degrees of freedom. If the new physics could be something conventional, like gravitational waves. They also carry energy density, like radiation. It could be new massless particles, like you know, majorons, famulons. People speculate about new global symmetries. Um, it could be new neutrinos themselves, right? Or it could be some other uh, uh, weakly interacting particles that people think of. Now, in order to do all this, uh, we have to know what the fate of the theory to the data is. The data would consist of primordial abundance of helium, uh, which we measure in this blue compact galaxies. Yesterday, someone was asking, how do you know when a galaxy is, you know, uh, uh, how far away it is? So these are nearby galaxies, but they're blue uh, because uh, they are actually, they're very old. They, have, uh, they haven't had much star formation. And therefore, you hope that the abundance of helium that you measure there is close to the primordial value. You have to make a little correction. Then um, you measure the abundance of deuterium in these clouds of gas that uh, are seen in absorption on the, in the light of very distant quasars, which are basically point sources. And then uh, for the lithium-7, you can measure the abundances of stars which are in the so-called POP2, population two of the galaxy. They are in the halo of the galaxy. They are supposed to be part of the original cloud from which the galaxy condensed. And they're supposed to be much older than the gases, than the stars in the disk. So this is a huge subject, mainly astrophysics. So I'll just give you the broad brush uh, answers. Uh, we, I had to learn all this because uh, along with two colleagues, we. Uh, survey the literature every year on behalf of the particle data group because the helium abundance and the, you know, these abundances uh, are very important part of constraining new physics. So particle physicists want to know how reliable is all this, right? So the helium abundance is measured in extragalactic regions, as I said, with the lowest abundances of oxygen and nitrogen. So this is helium versus oxygen. Why th do that? Because Stars also make helium. Our star is making helium. But at the same time, it's also making oxygen. So if I correlate the two, then I can take out the part that is been made by stars and hopefully get back to where the oxygen abundance was zero. Of course, there are no stars there, but I can draw that line and I can see what the intercept is. Notice that on this scale, the abundance of the sun will be out there somewhere. The, but the sun is much, much more oxygen rich than these. These are really very so-called metal poor stars. Astronomers call anything above helium a metal, right? So these are metal poor. They don't have any oxygen or nitrogen. Lithium-7 is measured in population two stars. This is the lithium abundance in ratio to hydrogen. And this is showing you the surface temperature. So you see that at low temperatures, like our sun is around here, there's a huge scatter. But as you go to the highest temperatures, there seems to be some kind of a plateau. And uh, these people who found this, Pete and Spit, believe that this is because at this point, there is no more convection that is mixing up the layers and destroying lithium. It's a very uh, fragile element. Uh, and so you uh, can interpret this as the primordial value. Now, helium abundance is measured according to this scheme. You measured it in various galaxies, and then you try to draw this line. But of course, the helium abundance is not written on the picture of the galaxy. You have to infer it. We have to construct a model for the pressure and the temperature uh, and the density of the emitting region. You have to have some understanding of how the radiation is it in local thermal equilibrium or not. And this is all very tricky. Right? So therefore, uh, it is not surprising that different groups have actually found different values for the primordial helium abundance. They use different techniques. What is surprising to me that it is, is such a fundamental uh, importance, this helium abundance. For example, we'll see that it puts a bound on the number of neutrino-like species. So when the number of neutrino species was measured from the uh, width of the Z boson at LEP, there are about, I don't know, 2,500 physicists involved. Here, there are just five groups, okay? And <laughs> so their numbers differ. These, these are clearly some estimate of the uncertainty, which are not clearly uh, very rigorous, because uh, if it is really an absolute number, then they don't agree with each other. The chi-square of the fit to a common value is very, very poor. So we often have to rescale this uncertainties uh, uh, to get a reasonable chi-square for the fit. And when we do all this, we get some number like 0.245, okay? Huh? 
you measure a, a, some line strength, you measure a helium line, you uh, typically measure several helium lines, and then you try to also measure the line strengths of some other elements. That helps you pin down the temperature and the density of the emitting region. And then you have to make some assumptions that they are both arising in the same region because you're looking at a little fuzzy thing on the sky and you're just looking at the spectrum. And so you have to make many assumptions, right? And then, of course, you do it for many regions and hope to take out the uncertainties and so on. So these people differ in the techniques they use uh, to try to uh, determine this abundance. For lithium, like I said, uh, you observe a so-called speed plateau in high, at high temperatures in population two stars, which are stars in the halo of our galaxy, but of course, you can only see the ones very close to us. They are orbiting through the galaxy, of course. And there you see a apparently constant value. Now, you might wonder what this scale is. This is very weird. This is the log of the number of lithium to hydrogen plus 10 for some reason. So, you know, in astrophysics, be prepared for all kinds of funny scales, right? So, that actually means a ratio of 10 to the minus 10 with respect to hydrogen. But anyway, we know, as long as you know what that is, that's fine. These are all log scales. You observe also that the, this same abundance level occurs in very metal poor stars. So this is plotted versus the iron abundance. So if you come to a star like the sun, you'll be somewhere here. And there's a huge scatter. But when you are in very metal poor stars, it appears to be some kind of a plateau. So this is believed to be the uh, primordial abundance, but of course you have no guarantee. In fact, it is discordant with the other ones. So we'll see. Uh, Deuterium is interesting. This was basically unknown for a long time because deuterium is an extremely fragile element. It gets broken up in stellar evolution. But there was a huge breakthrough when people realized that in that, for that spectrum that I showed you yesterday in the context of the Lyman Alpha Forest, this is the Lyman Alpha Forest uh, towards a quasar at redshift of 3.6. And these lines that you see are due to intervening clouds. If you take one of those lines and blow it up, you will find in the wing of the hydrogen line a little dip. This is due to deuterium. Okay? And the separation of that from here is only 80 kilometers a second. It's a tiny, tiny shift. And notice that the hydrogen line is saturated. The detector is so sensitive that it can't actually see how far down that goes. But it can see this little dip. And in order to see this, you need to live in California because this can only be seen by the telescopes of this 10 meter class. These are the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. And I'm told you only get time on those telescopes if you're at a university in California. So a good reason to move to California if you want to measure the deuterium abundance. And they have measured this. And you get numbers which are of order few times 10 to the minus 5. But they are a bit scattered, and uh, uh, when you try to correlate whether the scatter is due to some other abundance in the gas cloud, so those gas clouds that I uh, pointed to are not actually primordial. Clearly, some star formation has happened there, supernovae have gone off, because they also contain silicon and iron and heavy elements like that. So it is not entirely primordial, and people wonder what the scatter is due to. And so this was going on for 10, 20 years. But finally, there has been a breakthrough, which is that uh, very recently, uh, uh, this is Max Petini at Cambridge and Cook and so on, and various others, who have looked at a particular class of these Lyman alpha systems where the hydrogen column density can be measured, because you, you really want the D2H ratio. So it's no good if the H is, uh, 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 you know, saturated because then you can't measure it. They claim that they can measure the deuterium abundance now to this kind of precision, okay? And what do I know? I believe them, right? And when you put it all together, this is the deuterium, this is the uh, helium, this is lithium-7, and we don't consider helium-3 because that can be both created and destroyed, so you don't know what the abundance today, how it relates to the primordial one. And uh, we, as I said, we, our job is to work out the systematic errors based on the scatter in the data. Statistics is quite powerful. Sometimes without even knowing the details of how they got the numbers, you can just work out whether they're consistent by required, just in, if you have a prior, that there is an abundance, which is a unique value. So everyone should find that value within their uncertainties.
when you put that together on this plot which shows that calculation I gave you earlier of the predicted abundances as a function of the barrier to photon ratio and on top of that uh, this is the yellow band is our estimated abundance of helium uh, that one is the abundance of deuterium and um, this is the abundance of lithium. Now you see that helium and deuterium are in agreement and they determine the baryon to photon ratio to be in that interval around 6 10 to the minus 10. So actually I should write that down now more precisely as 6 10 to the minus 10 okay, that we have determined from nucleosynthesis. But in fact, uh, I showed you the uh, fluctuations in the microwave background. They are also sensitive to the baryon density because what we are seeing there are acoustic sound waves in the primordial plasma which are weighted by the baryon density that acts as a damping mechanism and that means that the ratio of the first acoustic peak to the second one, the bottom, that ratio it gives you the baryon density and the CMB determines this light blue check band and the two as you see are in very good agreement, right? So that is why uh, it is, you know, for tweeters, they didn't have to agree that well. Uh, in that case, we could not conclude as much as we now do. We get a lot of conclusions out of this. So that's BBN and that's CMP. So this immediately tells us a lot of things. This baryon to photon ratio is first of all, it's about five to six times larger than the amount of baryons that we actually see, uh, you know, in the Lyman Alpha forest, emitting X-rays in clusters of galaxies, as stars, as dust. So in other words, most of the baryons in the universe are actually dark. We only can measure them when we melt it all down into the primordial helium soup and measured uh, the synthesis of helium. But of course, the other point is that this omega BH square corresponding to this is down here, okay? We want to be up here if you want to account for all the matter in the universe. So that also tells us that most of the matter in the universe cannot be baryonic. At least could not have participated in nuclear reactions. So to be precise, cannot be nucleonic. Right? You could speculate about whether there are baryons that don't participate in nucleosynthesis. For example, people have talked about strange matter, quark nuggets and so on. But in, in uh, cosmology, somehow people now use the term baryon rather than nucleon. Nucleon is more pedantic really. Uh, anyway, so therefore we believe that it is some kind of exotic matter. Certainly it is exotic, it is not in the standard model. Right? That is a big, big thing to get out of a simple argument that we can cover in an hour, right? That most of the dark matter cannot be baryonic. Even if it was in black holes, by the way, it could not, it did not participate in nucleosynthesis. So therefore, this is still relevant. Another important thing is that it constrains the Hubble expansion rate at about a one second. And actually the Hubble expansion rate is better constrained at a one second than it is today. Because today the universe is very inhomogeneous it's not at all clear what you really mean by H0. At this time, the universe is very, very close to Einstein de Sitter. It's exactly omega equal to 1. It's at a redshift of 10 to the 12. Very well-defined expansion rate determined entirely by the radiation content. And therefore, we can measure it because that determines how much helium-4 is formed. And that, therefore, puts a bound on new particles. However, the snag is simply that lithium uh, does not agree with this. You would have expected that much lithium, you are seeing something about three times smaller and this discrepancy is quite significant. But, however, there is no consensus as yet on whether this, is, this really needs new physics. People speculate that you could have new physics doing it, I will give you an example. But it could be astrophysical, it could just be messy convection, something in the envelope of a pop to star, who knows, right? The astrophysicists claim that it can't be because I uh, will give you an example. So uh, the baryon density, as I said, is also determined by these acoustic oscillations in the microwave background, uh, which have left that imprint on the last scattering surface. And essentially, this shows you as you increase the value of the baryon density, the height of the first peak goes up and the bottom of the second peak goes down. So the ratio of this to this, you can read off the baryon density. There is a little degeneracy with the spectrum, uh, but not very much. So this is a fair, pretty accurate measurement.
right? And there is also a degeneracy of the optical depth to last scattering, which will damp all the peaks. And uh, but you know this is from the best fit. And this idea goes back a long time to the seminal papers, uh, which uh, gave you the physics of this thing, which I have no time to discuss, unfortunately. Now. It is important to notice that this measure is happening at an age of 400,000 years. The Big Bang nucleosynthesis measurement is happening at one second. There's a big gap between the two. So there is really no reason why the two should agree if something had happened in between. Conversely, if the two do agree, as we see they do, then it seems to be very unlikely that something actually happened. In principle, two things can happen. One could have increased the baryon density and uh, I mean photon number, and the other could have reduced the photon number such that they cancelled out. Who would know? Right? But that would be you know too much, right? So we we don't think in such conspiracies. We think that if two things agree, it means that you know most likely nothing happened. Therefore. Um, this can only be the case if there has been no dissipation of energy of any kind, say due to vorticity or primordial turbulence or antimatter annihilation or anything you can think of, black hole evaporation, nothing has happened. The un early universe was very staid and boring, which is good for us because we can then use it as a laboratory. right? And that then means that we can use this helium abundance to set bounds on the effective number of relativistic species. So that this is the line for three, but in fact you could have in principle more particles and the abundance of helium which you'll read off. So we are here, two, three, four, five, six. From, from here we can read off the helium abundance and see which line it comes on. Right? And then there are several other things I will give you an example. And I've always reminded of this quote by Mark Twain that you know you get such wholesome returns of conjecture out of such a trifling investment of fact. That is the great thing about science. <laughs> okay, that you get all this stuff out of one measurement. That's wonderful, you know. So let's see how that goes. So the element abundances, as we said, are sensitive to the expansion history. So that's the expansion rate, h square is just going proportional to the relativistic degrees of freedom. And that counts the particles we know of, and they could we could characterize things we don't know about. We can parameterize them in terms of the energy density of neutrinos. This is the old game. It goes back to Hoyle and Taylor, 64, who already set a bound on the number of relativistic species then. right? And Schwarzman, uh, uh, set a, uh, the, a precise bound uh, from this argument uh, later, and then this has continued in the literature. So uh, before the CMB, if just using helium as a probe, we had a bound where n, delta n nu could be up to 1. Okay, And that is what Tracy referred to yesterday. Now, if you put in the value of eta from the CMB, then it is no longer a free parameter. It is determined by the CMB. Now it becomes... Uh, basically around 3. As you know, we already expect from the standard model something like 3.04 or something. The not 4 is because of the slight heating of the neutrinos by E plus E minus annihilation. It's perfectly consistent with that. There is no evidence for any additional species. But you could have one. You could have a singlet neutrino, for example. Uh, this is from a recent review which shows uh, what the number of neutrino species is peaking at more or less three, but you can, the likelihood will extend to an additional species if you are, if your model predicts a new light particle which was in thermal equilibrium, contributes maybe some fraction of a neutrino species, you know, it's probably still okay. But as observations get sharper, um, then this will be ruled out. So right now, there is a lot of talk about a singlet neutrino and whether it's allowed by nucleosynthesis, to my mind, Knowing what I do about the uncertainties in the abundances, it is definitely allowed. Okay? Another example is this thing that I alluded to earlier, that the decoupling of the weak interactions happens at a temperature which is very sensitive to the uh, weak interaction and the gravitational interaction. The two are in competition, so that is involved there. And the helium abundance uh, is essentially this Boltzmann factor of the mass difference between protons and neutrons divided by the decoupling temperature, the freeze-out temperature. That is what's determining the neutron-proton ratio to be about a sixth, and all the neutrons end up in helium-4, therefore giving you 25% helium. So you can see this involves the strong coupling and the electromagnetic coupling. So you can constrain all of them, again, barring uh, conspiracies, 
you know, that they all don't vary uh, such as to cancel each other out. So this is a very, very powerful bound of um, uh, any variations in fundamental couplings, right? Another thing that it rules out very trivially is it, for example, you know, people talk about this cosmological constant, and I said it is of order h naught square, and that brings in this y now problem. So a lot of people say, well, maybe it's of order h square. So there is no not. It has always been of order h square. Actually, that cannot be. That that is simply not possible because if I write, if you can see here, if I write h square equals 8 pi g rho by 3, right, uh, plus uh, lambda. And if lambda is proportional to h square, right, so I just take out, so, sorry, by lambda by 3. If lambda corresponds to h square by 3, then I can just take it to the left hand side, right, and this would correspond to a renormalization of g. g will go to g divided by 1 minus 1 third, okay. So it is not actually uh, going to give you any accelerated expansion, and it's also ruled out because gn has to be within a few percent of the value that you measure in the lab, according to primordial nuclear synthesis. So this uh, very simple bound actually rules out the possibility that the uh, cosmological constant is actually scaling with the expansion. Uh, so I already mentioned this uh, uh, bound on the fine structure constant. You saw that from the measurement of the lines in quasar spectra, uh, it was restricted to be less than a few parts in 10 to the 5 up to redshift of 4. Now we are restricting it to be less than 5% up to a redshift of 10 to the 12. So it's a longer lever arm. There are interesting discussions. This happened about you know, 10 years ago. There was a lot of activity. People were trying to think of the variations of fundamental couplings in the context of string theory. And uh, the point is that then you look a bit deeper into what gives you the neutron-proton mass difference. So there is one component which is coming from that's the fact that the proton is charged and the neutron is neutral. But there is also breaking up isospin invariant. So you get a strong interaction contribution. They are of opposite signs. So there is a lot of interesting things you can do there. right? Of course, if you had a theory for how these changes in the couplings arise, then you could uh, put a very strong constraint on the corresponding parameters in the theory. You could restrict the variation of fine structure constants, et cetera, to much, much more rigorously than naively as here, right? But you get the general picture. We have a beautiful laboratory going back to the prime, you know, the, the, the seminal paper in 1953 by Alpha, Harman, and Gamma, uh, which uh, gives us a probe of new physics at a second after the Big Bang, right? So basically, if the physical constants today do vary with time, their expectation values of some flat direction fields or something, that all that should have happened before a second, okay? Uh, final example is decaying particles. Now, in extensions of physics beyond the standard model, you often have uh, very long-lived particles because they are very, very weakly coupled. So, for example, um, when you, you know about supersymmetry, when you promote that to a, a break supersymmetry locally, uh, then you have supergravity. And in such theories, you have massive particles. You have the superpartner of the graviton, gra gravitino which is expected to be around weak scale, but it only can decay through gravitational interactions. And therefore, uh, sorry, it's got a little thing. So the gravitino can decay through a gravitational interaction into a photon and its super partner, the photino, if you like, or the neutralino. And that lifetime will be very, very long. It will be of order a day, because this is decaying through gravity, not through weak or electromagnetic interactions or strong interactions. So basically, it is going to decay around the time of nucleosynthesis. And various people have discussed this uh, possibility. And uh, from the fact that these decays are of a massive particle that will then generate a cascade, a radiation cascade in the primordial plasma with a lot of low energy photons that can then break up all the helium and deuterium and everything you made and wipe it all out, you can require that such decays are tightly constrained. And in particular, say, not more than one in power 
uh, one particle in 10 to the 11 should have decayed uh, as a function of the lifetime. So you can see it becomes most precise around here, but even down to a second or so, this plot continues, you can constrain the number of decaying particles. And uh, this allows you to then put a bound on, for example, the maximum temperature the universe could have reheated to after inflation, because that could have created these particles through two to two processes. So, you know, you, you get a lot out of, you know, as Mark Twain said, you get a lot out of a simple input, right? And uh, so in summary, we have discussed today just this little epoch between one second and half an hour. That's how nucleosynthesis lasts. When, uh, as I said, the physics was very simple. It was a very dilute, radiation-dominated uh, epoch. Uh, the expansion rate was given, driven just by radiation. The density was low enough that many body effects are unimportant. So equilibrium thermodynamics works perfectly well, and we can do that. So therefore, we can calculate everything precisely. We can now take into account all the uncertainties in the reactions that go into it. Um, we try and measure them as well as possible, of course. And I showed you that as recently as uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the neutron lifetime actually jumped by five sigma. So things keep moving. That that jump is why we can allow an extra neutrino. Okay. And uh, that means that we have a, a, a deep probe of the Big Bang, and this is all established physics. This is all old physics, nuclear physics, you know, uh, kinetic theory. But this concordance between these abundances and the predictions means that a very fundamental conclusion, um, that is what Tracy Slatier lectured on, that the dark matter cannot be baryonic, right? Uh, in fact, it also shows that most of the baryons are dark, but that's a different story. That's for the astrophysicists to worry about. But this is something of interest to particle physicists, because then that raises the possibility that extensions of the standard model, which naturally have uh, sometimes new conserved quantum numbers, so there are new stable particles, that they could be the dark matter. We can also put constraints on any deviations from the expansion history, right? So if you put it all together, I would say nucleosynthesis is still the final frontier as we look back to the Big Bang. Although we know that the dark matter was created uh, possibly earlier, we don't know exactly when. We know that the baryon asymmetry was certainly created earlier, but again, we don't know when. And uh, finally, the fluctuations in the microwave background are due to primordial perturbations that were created, again, we don't know when, sometime earlier. The understanding of those three relics is work still in progress. We don't have a complete theory. Of course, you have lots of very interesting ideas and speculations, and that's what keeps most people busy who work on early universe physics. But this is in a sense done and dusted. There is no new physics in nucleosynthesis, but it has repaid our investment of effort by providing us this amazing laboratory for new physics uh, and uh, of a caliber which is enough to give interesting constraints on any new ideas that you come up with for physics beyond the standard model. Thank you. Questions? You all had heavy breakfast, so you're not so, <laughs> you don't have to rush to lunch. So can you explain the concept of the Big Bang and the string theory? Okay, so, uh, well, string theory, as you know, as uh, Andre explained, essentially lives in a higher dimensional space time, right? We unfortunately live in a lower dimensional space time. The real problem is trying to make a link between the two. And in particular, what happens to the extra dimensions? So there are some parameters, they're called moduli, which determine the sizes and shapes of these extra dimensions. Now they have to freeze, they have to be locked. Otherwise you are not ever going to get down to some fixed four dimensional space time that you live in. Now there are some ideas about how that happens. You know, we won't go into that. But be that as it may, the, all these couplings of nature, the things that we call fundamental constants, are actually determined by these very moduli, right? So on general grounds, you'd expect that these, therefore, have not been fixed for all time. At some point, they evolved. Maybe the modulus, modulus field got some potential. There was some flux. I don't know. Somehow, everything got locked down. 
All we are saying is that you better do that lockdown uh, at early enough in the uh, you know evolution, long before nucleosynthesis. Right. So this may not seem like much of a constraint, but actually it is quite effective in some contexts. So you can say that. Basically, all this should have happened before a temperature of order 1 MeV. In fact, you could argue it should have happened before 100 GeV, right? Before the usual. The situation is complicated by the fact that we don't actually have phase transitions in the standard model. There is no phase transition associated with either uh, the Higgs process or with the quark hadron transition, right? So we have been always in the Higgs phase in a sense. So therefore, uh, in principle, you could consider, uh, say, the generation of the baryon asymmetry at a temperature as low as a few MeV due to, for example, the decay of some field that carries baryon number, right? So we don't really know anything about what happened for sure. But up to one MeV, I know for sure, okay? And that's one second. Now, one second on a log scale is not that very close to the Big Bang, but it is very close to the Big Bang given that we have survived for 14 billion years after that. So I know the last 14 billion years. I just don't know before the first second, that's all. I mean, that's, that's some progress, right? Yeah. Yeah. So at some point you calculated, uh, you made a question, you calculated what's the highest temperature that the universe could, could have reached. Yes. Uh, it was uh, 10 to the f 14 GeV. Let me get that thing up. No, uh, it's actually uh, good to, to uh, stay on that. Okay, all right. Does that mean that uh, the bottom of Yes, the yes, bottom yes, bottom yes, yes. That, that, that bottom, the well, the guy who made this plot clearly, so uh, this, this, so these things don't mean anything. Yes. <laughs> They don't mean anything. That's just an energy scale. You expect granulification to happen at 10 to the 16 GeV in a supersymmetry granulified theory. So I think what happened was uh, that the people who uh, first wrote a paper on this, at that time when they did this, this was Steigman, somebody and somebody, long ago. At that time, the granulification was supposed to met, happen at 10 to the 15 GeV in the old days, right? SU5, minimal SU5. And when they estimated this thing, they probably didn't put in the numerical factors quite right, and they got around 10 to the 15. Actually, when you do it carefully, it is 3, 10 to the 14, and the granulification scale has climbed to 10 to the 16. So now there is clear water between the two. But I think it's, yeah, so beyond this point, 10 to the 14 GeV, we don't even have a sense of a temperature. Right? If you go early enough to the Big Bang, you don't even have the notion of an uh, ensemble because you don't even have more than one particle within one causally connected horizon. So in order to have an equilibrium distribution, you've got to have lots of particles. Right? So if they're causally disconnected from each other, there is no sense of an ensemble. So people, so a lot of calculations are done in cosmology which actually go back to T of zero. The famous horizon problem, which is supposed to uh, motivate inflation, involves calculating the light cone back to T of zero. That's impossible to do. We don't even know if there is a metric at T of zero. So many of these things look very simple when I write it down and everyone says, yeah, yeah, I've seen that before. You think about it for a minute, it's actually very weird. Can you actually do that? Can you calculate? I mean, how do I know that light goes in straight lines on null geodesics close to T of zero? Maybe it goes on some winding mode. So yeah, you should be alert to things like that. That is wrong. <laughs> I, I borrowed this picture from somebody, so I'll tell them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you know, you can you can see that um, we have actually already come halfway down this picture, uh, plotted as it is, in terms of our understanding of the early universe. And this part is all speculative. Yeah, there was another question. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Right. And using the S, the ratio between the Hubble, uh, modified Hubble, uh, right. the right. standard mm. Hubble, mm. Uh, and we revised it in terms of the change in the neutron lifetime. Yes. Okay, uh, mm. 20, uh, 20 to 12, I don't mm. know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, so, uh, so when, when uh, the, I think you're referring to the fact that uh, in round 2012, that must have been about right, there was a claim from a Russian group who were measuring the neutron lifetime using bottled neutrons to have got a value which was much smaller than the other groups. And uh, so it was an outlier. There were like five experimental measurements that were consistent. And then there was this one group that was out. So as is standard practice, we don't, in the PDG, we don't average things unless they're consistent. So that was ignored, right, initially, to be, put it bluntly. And then um, one of these uh, precise measurements which contributed to this five, they revised their data and said, yeah, we are actually getting a smaller number. So it took a few years until it was appreciated that the correct measure value is, in fact, 890 seconds. Right. Correct meaning today. So if I can go back to that plot, you can see uh, how things have gone. And the point is that uh, what Stegman was doing, Stegman rather, was doing was um, trying to anticipate what effect this would have on the helium abundance. So as I said, you got to lock the neutrons up in a magnetic bottle near a very powerful reactor like at Chernobyl, and then you measured the exponential decay. And there are going to be fluctuations because sometimes the neutrons are lost out of the bottle and that this is a very important systematic. So the neutron lifetime uh, earlier, uh, before, actually on, the, so this is only going up to 2010. There was a jump at this point. Sorry, this doesn't even show the modern value. So uh, there was a jump at this point and uh, a low measurement, uh, which was I think quoted on the previous slide. Uh, that's right. This is the current value. It's 880 now. Sorry, I, I, did, I said 890 earlier. So he just said that if it dropped, if the neutron lifetime drops, what does that mean? It means that uh, the rate is faster. If the rate of weak interactions is faster, it will freeze out when the Hubble rate is also faster, in other words, a little earlier. A little earlier, the neutron-proton ratio, uh, which is e to the minus mass difference over t, is a little bigger. Right? So if you put it all, take it all into account, what this means is that the rest constraint on the expansion rate, hence on the number of neutrino species, is altered. Right? And uh, so what I've shown you is the latest calculation taking all the right numbers, and that then gives you uh, whatever it is I said was the bound on the number of neutrino species, which is best to remember shorthand is of order uh, uh, point it's, it's of order one, okay, just, just say of order one. So that's why I did not quibble when Tracy Slatier said one. You can allow one extra species. People, of course, take these, you know, these uncertainties very seriously, but a standard fact is that most of the time when people quote plus minus something, that is not really in one sigma, because one sigma is a well-defined concept in Gaussian statistics. You should really look at the full likelihood. That is why I'm showing this here. Right? So you can see that it has a tail. You, the three is here. You can easily allow an extra species. Okay? You, I mean, from here, it might appear that you are sort of very, very unlikely. That's like you know, some kind of a three, four sigma outlier. It is, but that is, if it was a Gaussian distribution, it really is. So I'm afraid we all do this. We, we are quoted some sigma, you know, and then we take that literally and think of it as meaning something higher than that is excluded. Best thing is to, uh, if you have a model, if I really believe that there was a right-handed singlet neutrino, you know, which contributes, say, 0.4 species or something, right? then I would look at the data seriously and ask whether it is consistent. And nine times out of 10, I would find everything is fine. Right? All these constraints are imposed almost as a challenge to people who then have some ax to grind to come and look at them more closely. But this is the state of the art. We are, I mean, you know, when this business started, so at this time, I remember uh, in, um, it, so this is the original paper by Steigman, Schramm, and Gunn, which uh, gave some number like four, right? Uh, the systematic uncertainties that I emphasized were recognized only later. People thought at the time precise measurements had been made. They had not been. But at the time, uh, the number of neutrino species, when LEP actually measured the Z width, the number of neutrino species from K on DK could have been as high as a thousand. Okay? There was no constraint on it at all. So the nucleosynthesis bound was very, very important. It was the only thing that told us that you could not have a thousand species.
or even now if you have neutrinos not coupled to the Z okay or some new massless bosons which have no other interactions how do you constrain them this is the only way to do it you cannot make them in the laboratory yes any no, I think they are hungry now <laughs> yes, sir, sir.